Amen. That's good. <clears throat> All right. Open the Bible now. Let's get in the book. <clears throat> Amen. All right. We're going to look in Psalm uh, 78, I think, to start with there tonight. Hold your Bibles. Uh, keep your Bibles handy there. You did bring your Bible tonight, right? You did bring your Bible, right? Everybody got your Bible tonight. Say phone. That's a phone. I don't know about your Bible. B-I-B-L-E, as in book. Well, you can turn to these scriptures. Now, don't come to church not bring your Bible. Look here at Psalm 78. Psalm 78. I want to show you a very interesting verse of scripture tonight. And um, we'll, we'll move right along because we've got a lot to talk about in a little while. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. This is a strange verse of scripture if you don't understand it right. Look at Psalm 78. Uh, let's see here. Verse 40. I don't know that toward the end of it. Verse 40, how oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Look at that word, limited. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Is that possible? People limited God? Sure did. That's what it said. When I first read that, I thought, well, I mean, that don't sound right. That contradicts what we, how we think about God. We think about, nope, nothing can stop God. Nothing can hinder Him. But the, the Bible says that they limited Him. Now, I want to preach on that tonight. How we limit God. How we limit God. It almost sounds blasphemous to say that me, a little bitty human being, Danny Castle, could limit God Almighty. But yet, I'm going to show you in the Bible tonight that you absolutely can. And God fixed it so that he will only do so much depending on what me and you do or, or don't do. That's right. And that's a great truth here in the Bible that a lot of people say. Some people said this. They said, uh, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. That's a good, a good little philosophy to live by. The word limit, listen to this. The word limit means restrict, restrain, uh, set a boundary. We can restrain God Almighty. Me, little bitty boy like me, can, can, can hold back God. Absolutely, we sure can. Let me show you three ways that we limit God working in our life. Uh, First of all, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 6. It's very important that you get this. Mark chapter number 6. And let's look here tonight at a verse of scripture here that says this. Mark chapter 6. And I want to say, we limit God when we do not trust Him. We limit God when we do not trust Him. Mark chapter number 6. And look at verse number 6. Look at this. Uh, or I'm 5. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, let's read 4. But Jesus said unto them... A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work. It didn't say he wouldn't. It said he couldn't. Them people stopped Jesus from doing a mighty work. How? Look what he said. Because of their unbelief. Verse 6. And he went around the village just teaching. That means this. That means this. This is a shocking thought, y'all. That means the Lord would have done all kind of things there. But because they did not believe him, he didn't do it. They limited him by their unbelief. That, that scares me. That, that terrifies me to think, and I'm sure I've done it, that my unbelief might stop God from doing something in my, my home, my own life, and our church. You know... What we need to do, camp meeting coming up, all of us together as a group, collectively, they just say, Lord, we're going to believe you. We're going to believe we can, can't we? I mean, uh, we believe the Lord. I mean, he's real. He saved us. He's coming back after us. We can believe him. He said he could do no mighty work. Do you realize that doubt, unbelief destroyed the world in Noah's day? Do you realize that all that time Noah's up there building that ark, all them people said, I ain't, ain't nothing going to happen. There ain't nothing going to happen. There ain't nothing going to happen. 
That, no, no, that is the worst attitude we can have as a child of God. Ain't nothing going to happen. Oh, Lord, here come camp meeting. And we'll go on night. Most people shout, go to the altar. So what? Big deal. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, brother, we need to ex- attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. You know, our country right now is in a position, uh, this part of the country, where we could see a mighty move of God. We could see a mighty move of God. I know some of you are sitting there saying, yeah, I know, and it probably ain't going to happen. That's why it don't. Uh, that's why it don't. Uh, We limit God when we do not trust Him. God always leaves His best to them that leave the choice with Him. That's right. And uh, David, when he went to fight that giant, he said, Lord, I'm not going to let me. You can do anything. People said, David, you ain't but a teenager. You can't kill that big guy. No, I can't. But I'm trusting in somebody that can. That's that's what we got to do. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm coming at this camp meeting, and my mindset is, you know what? Lord, we're not much. We're just a little shining light Baptist church. We're a speck on the the map down here. Most people in the world never heard or never will hear about us. But I tell you one thing, I know what you can do. I've seen you do it before. I know, God, you're real. Hey, he can still help our teenagers. He can still help our marriages. He can still help our, our relationships. He can still answer your prayers. He can still help you. If you'll let him, amen. Uh, we, sh- we shut the door on God. Uh, that's right. We limit God when we do not trust him. We sure do. Uh, Gideon went down there and the Lord shrunk his army. He had thousands. And the Lord said, too many. Shrunk it down. The Lord said, too many. Shrunk it down. The Lord said, too many. Shrunk it down. He finally wound up with 300 guys and went and got conquered that city uh, and done the job that God called him to do. So we limit God when we do not trust him. He has all power. Number two, we limit God when we won't pray to him. Now listen, we limit God when we do not pray to him. If you're thinking, you know what, I pray every day or, I, you know, a big deal. I don't expect, we limit God when we do not pray to him. The Bible and history is filled with examples of people who prayed and found out that God could do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Let me show you this in the Bible. Take your Bible and turn to James 4. I showed you that first thing in the Bible. Let me show you this second one. James chapter number four, and this this is a this a this is a, a dagger in your heart, brother. This is a rebuke to every one of us in here tonight. Every person in here this evening needs to get this verse and get it good. You got something you need God to do in your life? Have you got marriage problems? Have you got kid problems? Have you got health problems? Have you got financial problems? Are you te- te- teenage? Are you wrestling with sin? You do something you ain't supposed to, and you know it ain't right, and then you do it again, you know it ain't right, then you do it again. Some habit, some addiction, music, drugs, uh, fornication, all kind of sin like that. Look here, look here what this said. We limit God, we don't pray to Him. Look at James chapter number 4 and verse number 2. Look at this. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, but yet ye have not, because ye ask not. The Lord said, I would have done this if you'd have just asked me. Oh, good night. I hate, I hope, I don't want to get to heaven. And the Lord said, you know what, Brother Danny? And I'll say, what, Lord? <laughs> and he'll say, he'll say, you know what I was going to do for you one time? What? And I was going to do, you was? And I thought it wouldn't happen, so I didn't ask for it. You know, look, it's better just to ask him if you don't get it. Ain't nothing wrong with asking. Now, every parent knows what I'm talking about. How many of you had at least one kid and your all your kids that just kept on and on and on? Mama, can I do this? Daddy, can I go there? I have uh, two daughters sitting over yonder uh, this evening. And uh, sometimes, I, I, I hate telling this, but uh, sometimes they'd say, Daddy, can I do this? Can I have that? Can I go? I'd say, no. And, uh, you know, that's the easiest answer. No. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, they come back next day or two. Daddy, can I have this? Can I go there? Can I do this? I'd say, no, I told you. Did I not tell you no? And then, and then in the back of my mind, this has happened. In the back of my mind, I'm saying, you know what? If they ask me again, I'm just going to do it. And they quit asking. See, you'd have got that car. 
If you ask one more time, I was going to do it. Uh, now, now, Carrie would ask, Corey would ask, Chris over there would ask, um, and she would, she would sort of con me a little bit. Uh, uh, I'd come home one day, and she'd vacuum the floors, cleaning the house and everything. And I thought, now, she's done something. She don't want to get in trouble for or something. And then it, then it kept me. She wanted to go somewhere or, or do something. That's, that's not really a bad philosophy. That's not really. The Bible said, Bible said that we get what we need from God because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Amen, brother. You please the Lord. He's liable to just give you what you're asking for. And you say, well, brother Danny, I've been praying for a, a, a girlfriend. I've been praying for a boyfriend. I want to I wanna get me. Be careful what you ask. <laughs> You might get it. What's the God you're hatting for? It's over with. Uh, but I'm telling you, God, God's able to give us what we need. You, you have not because you ask not. That's right. I, I remember years ago, uh, when people started in here, man, that big old bank was over there. And I, I was sitting here and dreamed. And I'd say, man, it sure would be nice if all them 10 million gallons of acres of tubs of water, bank would get gone and we could build a building over there. And you know, I remember saying, Lord, we sure would be good if we could have us a building over there to have fellowship then, birthday parties, camp meeting dinners, wedding receptions, basketball, uh, other little things like that. Uh, I said, Lord, it sure would be good if we had that building. And you know what? We're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Amen. Another big flood like we had the other day and rest that mud will be gone. Uh, uh, the Lord might just clean it all out for us. I'm telling you tonight, listen, God is unlimited. God is all powerful. God is able to do anything. He's able to fix what you think he can't fix. He's able to heal people that needs healing. He's able to supply you with a job he's able to supply you with with clothes uh with a car with with a livelihood god's able we limit god we don't pray to him that's right that's right that's right you learn how to pray to god he'll he'll give you some answers amen uh sometimes about revival and camp meeting and stuff i sometimes i think of um I, I travel. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor but i'm an evangelist and i travel around and i i, I used to travel oh good night <laughs> 30, 38, 38 weeks out of 52 every year going to different churches and travel around. And I and ever I used to go to the same place over and over and over, and I still do, 20 years in a row. And sometimes I'll go in there, they'll, they'll say, well, it's revival time. Good to have Brother Danny back for our revival. And the same people sitting there with the same look on their face, stand up and give the same testimonies. Do the same motion. That's good. I ain't fussing about it. But you know, I think, you know what? I, I can't imagine how much money is wasted by churches flying in evangelists from who knows where, plane ticket, meals at restaurants, love offering, all that money. Some of them spend thousands and thousands of dollars on youth meeting, count me. I'm talking, I mean, Tom Talk Church spent fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, and everybody is exactly the same as it was before it started. I'm not against it, and I do it, and we have it here. But listen, if we don't let it change us, if we don't let it, if we don't do something about it, listen, you're wasting your time sitting there. Listen, if you ain't planning on doing not one blessed thing I ever say. You're, we're not supposed to be just hearers of the word, but what? Doers of the word. Absolutely. Are you going to do that? You're going to sit there like a knot on a log and be mad at somebody or upset about this. Don't you realize that's a demon? Uh, keep it diverting you and messing you up so you can't get a blessing? Do you realize tonight the devil will use anything? If he can't get you to go get drunk, he'll get you aggravated to somebody. He'll get you mad at your husband. He'll get you mad at your wife. The devil's got more than two tricks, people. They more than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The devil's got attitude and bitterness and gossip and all kinds of things that he'll use to keep you from getting a blessing. So, if you got hard feelings, get rid of them. You, you mad at your husband? Get right. Mad at your wife? Get right. That your prayers be not what? Hindered. Uh, that's right, brother. I'll never forget. You've heard me tell a story. Many years ago, I was going through one of my bad, bad times. And I'm telling you, y'all, I was hurting so bad. It, it, if you'd just hit, stood me up and just slapped me in the face over and over and over, it would have felt good to how I felt. My heart was breaking. 
I was hurting so bad that I didn't know if I could make it. And a preacher called me over there to Robbinsville, North Carolina. Robbinsville, way over yonder, almost a tip. Murphy, over at the Natahala place over yonder. And a preacher called me. He said, Brother Danny, I want you to come and preach revival. I said, Brother, I'll be glad to if I can. And I'd never been there in my life. He gave me some directions. I, I drove. And on the first night of that revival, I'll never forget y'all, I was tore all to pieces. I won't go into detail, but it was bad. I'm talking real bad. I'm talking about suicide bad for some people. And I remember, I remember thinking, Lord have mercy. And the devil said, you don't know you go to no preach no revival. You don't even know. You ain't no preacher. And the devil had people telling me the same thing. One lady met me uptown one day. She said, you can't pastor church and raise three girls and be an evangelist. And I thought, boy, you're a good godly encouragement. But something down deep inside me said, we'll see about that. <laughs> Amen. I tell you what, if God wants me to, I can. And he must have wanted me to because by the grace of God, we did. Now, it was not without our problems. <whistles> Y'all heard me tell stories about them girls. We had some times, didn't we? Oh, good Lord, did we have some times. Lord, I remember Chris, she probably still does. I'd be going off preaching somewhere. Uh, you know, we didn't have cell phones. And I, they didn't know what time I was getting home. I'd be coming home up there in Burnsville, Bakersville, Statesville, Lenore, North Wilkesboro, Gastonia, Gaffney, York, Kings Mountain. And I'd be driving home at night, and uh, I'd stop somewhere and put a quarter in my phone or something, call home. Okay, I said, Daddy, how long is it going to be before you get here? storm and we heard something outside. All right, it's all right. Lock the doors. I'll be there at 12. And Chrissa had a Bible and a gun underneath her pillow. Nothing wrong with that, are they? You mean you let your kid? Absolutely. And Annie Oakley over there take care of you, brother, if you try to break in our house. And uh, she, she probably still does that. I don't know. Dude. I guarantee you she's got one. She probably got it over there with her right now. Uh, I ain't saying. I ain't saying. But there ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong. You weirdo. You don't believe in guns for honest, good, law-abiding people. You're a nut. You are a nut. Amen. You know if we all give up our guns, you know who have them? The crooks. And we'd all get robbed. Amen. Uh, people fuss at me all the time. They say, Danny, don't you carry a gun? I, no, I don't, but I mean, I'm happy if you do. I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I guess I've needed them a few times. Uh, but by the grace of God, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Listen, and then and I'd come home, I'd come home and they'd say, we heard something. One time, Jeremy, I don't tell, talk much about Jeremy over there because he don't talk much in, in church. And this was after they'd been dating for a while and cell phones was invented and he sent me a text said did you know that Carissa is over at somebody's house <laughs> she was I said she was huh I was up I got one for Corey when I was in Kentucky uh, he did I mean, no he didn't he didn't do that scratch that right there you you might want to sleep in your house tonight uh, uh, but, but he and I, he, he was concerned about her the way he proposed, I always made them boys say, look, if you're going to ask a girl to marry you, you ought to go ask her daddy first, right? That's the right way to do it. I know this modern generation thinks that's crazy, but this modern generation is the one who's crazy. If you want to marry a girl, you go ask her father first, her hand in marriage. That's the way it's supposed to work. And the way he did it, <laughs> he, he sent me a text. It might have been around Christmas time or something. He said, I was wondering... Don't that sound like him? I was wondering if you cared if I gave Carissa a ring. I put in big capital letters, no! No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, actually. Uh, but you know what? Uh, they, they, they stayed there by themselves, and I'd finally get home. Stayed there by themselves, and I'd finally get home. We did it for years. We did it for years. It was crazy. And I was taking off over there to that revival. And I'll never forget, I, was driving, I had a little Toyota Camry, light blue, and I got from Mike McDaniels. He bought it new and didn't like it or something. We bought it from him. And uh, I got about over there, about halfway between Asheville 
And where Rob Mill is, one of them little towns over toward, toward Cherokee, that direction of that. I don't know what all the little towns are over there. And I couldn't stand it no more. And I pulled in a store, and it was raining. And it was first of November, and the leaves all dead and brown. And I hated it. And water's hitting that windshield. And I remember putting my head down, and I just started bawling. And I said, God, I can't preach. I can't have no I ain't no preacher. I can't, even, I can't even do what I'm supposed to. God, help me. Have mercy on me. And I wiped the tears out of my eyes, and I kept it driving. And it got worse and more and more dreary down through there, and it's foggy. Nothing to me is more depressing than an old foggy, cold winter evening. Oh, it's awful. And I met the preacher. He took me over to a little old bitty, old little tiny motel room. And I got out freezing to death, turned the heat on, laid down there and tried to rest a few minutes. And I got ready and went to church. And he, he said, I'll come by here and lead you to church, preacher. I said, all right. We went and we started going up these little roads just like this. You ever been to Robbinsville? You know, it's it, like, like going to Spruce Pine about 15 times. And went this way, that way, this way, that way. I said, ain't nobody going to be here. The devil said, there ain't no reason you coming in. Well you, waste, well, you need to be back home taking care of them girls, what you need to be doing. See, no matter what you do, the devil's going to condemn you. If I'd have stayed home, the devil said, boy, you ain't no preacher. You should be preaching. If you go there, say, you, you know how the devil, no matter what you do, the devil jumps on you and tells you you're doing wrong. And uh, I remember going over there and I walked in. That night, that first night of that revival, I sat down just like I always do. Right over there. The preacher said, Brother Danny, come on up here. There's some old mountain people come in there. The whole church was about as big as one of these sections right here. It probably held about 100, 125 maybe. And there was a pretty good little crowd there that night. And right before I got up to preach, I thought, God, I don't know. I'm a hypocrite. I don't even know how I am called. I don't even know if you're, if God, if you're even real. He said, Brother Danny, you've been preaching. At that time, oh, well, good night, 16, 17 years, and you was questioning whether or not, yeah, I was. I sure did. And there'll be times in your life when you will too. You, if it gets bad enough, you'll think, my goodness, is this even real? Don't, don't show your hands, but haven't we all been there at one time or another? God, are you even there? Oh, not me, Brother Danny, I've never doubted it. Well, us that think have, and I remember thinking, I'm not even, I don't even know if there is, I don't even know if I'm right. I'm a hypocrite. And preacher got up there and he said, we are so honored to have this young man. I thought, oh, Lord. Uh, he said, he's going to come and preach. And I said, all right, all I know to do. I remember Ed McAlee and all them saying, you go, you preach no matter what. You preach no matter how bad it is, how good it is. And I tried to open my Bible and I said, you ought to be faithful. We ought to be faithful. We ought to be faithful. And the whole time the devil said, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. Liar, you're telling him that you don't even believe God. I mean, it was, it, was, it was like something just slapping me in the face the whole time I was preaching. And I got through. And when I got through, we gave an invitation. And a few people come to the altar. And I talked about being faithful to church. And the man that was leading the singing come running down the, and fell down the altar and started bawling. I thought, wow, my goodness, something must be wrong. He stood up and he said, folks, he said, I'm not right. I ain't been right in a long time. He said, my boy, Michael, his boy's Michael. He's, I think he's in the ninth grade. And he's six foot four and already could dunk a basketball. He said, he's, on, he's down there in that gym playing ball tonight. And he said, I know. He said, God got a hold of me. And I know we all need to get right. He said, I'm going to go home tonight and tell him he's got to be here. And you know, the JV's had a game the next night. Uh, the varsity had a game and JV's had practice. And... He said that went around. I thought, well, that's good. About that time, some granny over here said, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Way, 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 way down deep inside, there was a little flicker. Just a little bit of hope. Just a little bit of hope. And I thought, well, glory to God, maybe I am saved. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is real. Have you, ever, have you ever been like that when you're just about to lose it and you're just about to think, God, my mind's popping. God, I'm about ready. And deep, deep, the Lord will do just a little tiny something deep inside. The flame has flickered, but the fire never, ever goes out. And I thought, hallelujah. Well, the next night they came in. And here come Michael. And he looked at me like he did not like me 
Because his daddy made him miss practice and the game that night. Little school over there. And they, they're football, them people's football champions a bunch of times, a little 1A school. And uh, they, he set him down right there. And I got up and I hit it again. And I preached as hard as I could. I gave them a tasting. Lo and behold, Michael hit the altar, got saved. Grandma shouted. And business started picking up. I said, well, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then the next, uh, and, and they started shouting around there and everything. And I thought, good night, maybe. Maybe I am still called to preach. <laughs> maybe I am still supposed to be doing this. And you know something? The next night, a bunch more got saved. So I said, Thursday night, we're going to do the rock music thing. I brought the uh, uh, pictures in there. I used slides back in them days. Showed the slide, played the music. Buddy, the cheerleaders come in there. The football players come in there. They had them Robinville Black Knight jackets on, and they filled that place up. I bet you, I bet there's 12 or 14 got saved that night. And the next night, and the next night, you want a long story short? 21 nights later, 21 nights later, we had 75 people saved. Half the town got right with God. It got in this high school. The teachers was crying. The students was coming to church. I mean, God blew that thing out. And it's still going on tonight. All because. You know something? You know something I learned? When you feel least worthy and empty and at the end of yourself that's when God can use you more and my pastor told me that and I, I said preacher I'm questioning everything he said you're in better shape now for God to use you than when you thought you knew everything it's true there's preachers pastoring churches today that came out of that revival we were like, she got home from school at three o'clock and we'd leave at 3 30 come in here eat you some noodle soup we got a liver must sandwich same thing you had for lunch. Hunter's liver must for lunch. Hunter's liver must for, uh, for supper. We made, I made her liver must sandwich, and we'd hit the road. It took three hours to get there, and we get there about 6.45. Night after night after night. Don't you mean you kept your kids out? No, yep, sure did. Don't you know that's bad for them? I don't know about it. It is or not. I think the Lord made it up to them. Some people said uh, the kids... Didn't get to do a lot of stuff. They said, that'll warp their personality, Brother Danny. And they did. Their, I mean, their personality is warped, but that ain't what did it. <laughs> it was other stuff. Uh, <laughs> from the enemy, like the modern day preachers say, do you know something? That's the office rival you ever seen in your life, y'all. Just pray. You may be in a hopeless situation. You may be in a situation where you say, this can't happen. I, I might as well forget, I don't see no way out. When you get like that, you keep praying. I'm talking about spending time. I'm talking about lay that stupid phone down a while this week and say, dear God, my kids need help. My home needs help. My marriage needs help. My family needs help. Our church needs help. The mountain people need help. I mean, we limit God when we don't pray to Him. Can we do that? The Lord ain't, ain't helped you if you ain't willing to change a little bit. Last thing I'll say and I'm through. We limit God when we sin against Him. Sure do. You want me to prove it? Isaiah 59. Look at Isaiah 59. Well, this will be the last verse. I got some others, but this will be the last one I'll have you turn to. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, 1. God speaking in the nation of Israel. You can absolutely parallel this to us as Christians. Isaiah 59, behold, look at verse 1. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, I know people say, well, we can't be perfect, Brother Danny. Well, I, I get it. I understand that. But I think, I think Derek was hitting on it in Sunday school this morning. Brother Derek, I heard him parts of it, and he was saying, listen, willful, deliberate living in sin definitely will block your prayers off from being answered to God. You know what I mean. I'm not talking about uh, the devil putting a thought in your head or you, know, you messing up and being a, 
you know, a grouch or saying something you shouldn't say to the Lord. I ain't talking about that. I'm not when you just say, hey, I know this is wrong, but nobody, nobody's perfect. I'm just going to smoke my weed and drink beer and, and shack up and do whatever I want to. It really don't matter. Your prayers won't go past that ceiling if you deliberately allow sin in your life. Scripture, Jesus told Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as the chicken does, uh, chicks under, under her wings, and you would not. The Lord said, I would have done this, but I didn't because you did that. We limit God when we don't, when we sin against him. You know something? When them people went out of Egypt, and Moses led them in the wilderness. It was 11 days. 11 days from Canaan to Egypt. And they walked around in circles for 40 years. And God just kept dealing with them. And dealing. That's why some people in their Christian life just going around in circles. I was talking about them churches I preach in a lot of time. Same, they're not a bit more spiritual, not a bit more right, doing the same things they've been doing for 15 years. Look, if we want a camp meeting, y'all, if this hurricane ain't got you out of your comfort zone, I mean, what's the Lord going to have to do, y'all? But it's, it's, it's helped me. It's been a wake-up call for me. It has. And I see most of y'all nodding your head. I mean, it, we, it could have easily been way, way worse here. Than it was. I think God must have had his hand on this area right in here. For some reason, I don't know. It ain't because we deserve it or we're more righteous or nothing like that. Brother, uh, it's just the mercy of God. Just remember, he can talk louder. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask husbands and wives. I'm going to ask teenagers. I'm going to ask those of you. Y'all come and get us a song, Carrie. And we're going to pray. You know what I'm going to do? This may have, I have not heard one church. Has anybody in here heard of a church having an all-night prayer meeting or anything after this hurricane? Anybody? I don't see any hands. What, 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 what's it going to take? If this don't do it, what, what's, what's God going to have to do to get our attention? We've got work all week. We're going to have a prayer meeting this Saturday evening, this coming Saturday at 7 o'clock. If you care 